Okay. I have to practice my Chris Neugebauer here. So, what we have to do is we have to practice everyone giving furious applause and then cutting it off really fast as soon as I go like, bah. Okay, so, go. Stop. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> I see why he loves doing this. The power. Okay. Um, in the final seconds of someone's talk, I'm going to start clapping with just these two little fingers. And I want all of you to do that as well when you see me do it. And we'll be doing that for about 10 seconds as that final warning is like, oh crap, they're out of time. Then the applause. And it's not. Yeah, oh god, this is so cool. We have quite a good selection of talks here. The talks are up to five minutes, and they're never more than five minutes. It is a pretty hard cutoff point. Um, I will be announcing the next speaker when the first speaker is about to go, and the next speaker needs to come down here and get to Ryan, who will get, get you set up, because we don't have much time between talks. So, with absolutely no further ado, sorry? Er, yeah, the other talk's done, right? We're already in here? You're all, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very, thank, thank you for checking. Um, with absolutely no further ado, I give you Tim Penny, your five minutes starts now. Okay. Hello, people. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the project that I'm involved with and a little bit about Python. Um, so, I work on a project for Canonical called Juju. It is an open source project, and it is used by Canonical to deploy complex workloads. For example, Kubernetes. We deploy this very quickly and frequently. Um, but as people are aware, when you're deploying software, complexity grows over time and things get more complex. So we also use it for deploying stuff like this, um, which is OpenStack. So one of the things Canonical does is we have a service where we will build and operate OpenStacks or Kubernetes for companies, and we have teams that are responsible for managing and operating. So we have a tool that was built for managing and operating complexity at large scale with small numbers of people. So, interestingly enough, it's about a million lines of Go, um, which does make me, well, you might be asking, why am I talking about it here? Um, but what we have, when you come back to these, these are applications that are deployed. Juju is effectively the engine that drives the deployment, um, but all of these components where you see EasyRSA, you see etcd, the Kubernetes master and workloads, they're all what we call charms. And the charms, over time, and we've learned the best programming language to write charms in is Python. So charms are effectively what we call encapsulated operations. So effectively, you have individual bits of software that you're deploying, and the charms encapsulates the best practice of how do we deploy this? How do we upgrade the software? And one of the key things that Juju does is this nifty thing called you know, automatic negotiation of configuration. What that means is you're not hard coding values of anything. So let's say you've got a simple, let's say, Django web app, and one thing Django frequently needs is a database. And when you're deploying your application, you don't necessarily want to hard code your credentials in your deployment scripts. So one of the things that Juju is very good at is negotiating information across what we call relations, where you relate two applications. So back in the previous slide, we had components with lines between them. Those lines are relationships. So for example, when you relate um, your application, your web application to your database, it will then negotiate to create um, your database, create a user and credentials, and then pass that information back so your web application can then save that and start. And it's how we manage all of those interesting things. What we learned, though, is as you deploy, as you're growing your charm, what could be anything, uh, any language, we found that Python is actually the best way to deal with that. And we had effectively created libraries around the best practices for writing charms, and we had a very reactive framework. Right now, the company is going through a process of re-architecting and redesigning how we write these encapsulated operations because we realized it was just too hard. So, Interesting things, brand new Python projects on its way for writing, writing reactive encapsulated operations. And if that is interesting to you, then it's worthwhile checking out. And that's it. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, on deck we have Ben Denham. Can you please come down and get yourself sorted with Ryan shortly?
And now we have Lee Begg. Your five minutes starts now. Right, so I'm going to quickly talk about saving turtles with Python and SDR. Um, so every day, all around the world, weather services launch weather balloons. Um, the technical name is actually the device underneath is called a radio son, and these are trackable by basically anyone. And so there is a project out there on the internet called SonHub, um, which helps uh, everybody around the world see what's going on. And I have uh, a setup in my house to track weather balloons in New Zealand, at least the ones that are launched near Wellington. Um, so this is live, this is happening right now. And so these weather balloons are really helpful for uh, weather services to understand what's happening at the higher levels of the atmosphere. This helps forecast things like um, uh, cold snaps and big storms coming. But they are basically a latex weather balloon and some electronics and some rope and some polystyrene. And eventually they fall from the sky. And they can fall pretty much anywhere. Um, so not far from where they're launched here in, uh, in, uh, on the Cavity Coast is a marine reserve. And I was thinking, really be nice to stop them from falling in there. Or maybe just pick them up when they fall in there. Um, but they also fall on land. And um, when they fall on people's farms in particular, uh, it's known that cows will eat, try and eat the weather balloon. It can be very bad for them. So uh, it'd be handy to be able to um, uh, know where they land and make a plan for trying to help clean up the environment just a little bit. And so uh, using really simple devices, uh, anyone can help with this um, uh, concept. So uh, basically with a Raspberry Pi, um, you can ha and a couple of extra pieces, so uh, an SDR dongle, um, which is normally just a USB device that plugs in, and it has an antenna connection. Um, they're frequently used for doing, um, uh, receiving TV signals into a computer, uh, but it, the electronics in it are so simple it doesn't actually, spe not specific to TV. So we are able to put some extra software in there, and using Python we can um, uh, arch uh, orchestrate the running of those processes to detect the balloons and then start decoding uh, the content coming from the actual radio sign. Um, and so for about, it's about $150, you could do this at home. And in New Zealand they launch from Auckland and from Invercargill and occasionally from other places. Um, so I think we can do more in this space and knowing where they're going first is the first step and then I think we can start looking to clean them up. Um, and so uh, if you go to sonhub.org, uh, there's some links there on the right uh, particularly this RadioSon AutoRx, that's the uh, Python software that, uh, that uh, orchestrates everything. Um, and it also has instructions about how to set that up on a Raspberry Pi and what uh, hardware you need. Um, so help me join, join together and, and um, help uh, do a little bit for the environment. Thank you very much, Lee. On deck next, we have Tim Bell. Come on down. But first, we have Ben Denham with a little lisp. Okay. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm going to attempt something a bit dangerous and talk about lisp at a Python conference. <laughs> um, so for those of you not familiar with lisp, that's the language with all the parentheses, and of course, the obligatory XKCD um, of the intergenerational lisp coders. Um, that's a bit of an example of what Lisp code looks like. You'll notice there are a, a lot of parentheses, and um, you get five in a row at one point. Um, I once did a check on one of my code bases, I think seven was the max I got up to. But the, um, you'll notice that um, parens are wrapping things on the outside, so everything looks like just nested lists, and it's, it's pretty different to um, code you'll be used to in other languages. Um, and really, Lisp is more like a family of languages. You've got common Lisp and Scheme. You've got uh, modern Lisps like Clojure and ClojureScript that will run on the JVM and JavaScript. 
um, Emacs Lisp for those people who don't like Vim, and even there's an argument to be made that even JavaScript itself is really more like a Lisp than Java, but that's another story. Um, have a look at the history, quite interesting, actually. Um, so why should you care about Lisp? Well, in my opinion, the killer feature it has is that your code is actually made out of lists. Your code is actually data. You get these great tools called macros that let you write code that edits other code, um, which is great for writing domain-specific languages. So that's when you need to write a little mini language that better expresses the ideas in your problem domain. Um, so for example, there are some great Lisp domain-specific languages for musical programming, um, where you can express ideas like phrases, chords, and notes better. Um, and another great example, Clojure has a library called Quarter Async, which basically gives the whole Go coroutine syntax as a library without any extensions to the core language itself. So that's well worth a look at. Um, and I'd also argue Lisp is worth learning because it just changes the way you think about programming. I think I've become a better programmer since I've started look, looking into Lisp. Um, but why am I talking about this at a Python conference? Well, there's a project you might not have heard of called Highlang, which is essentially a Lisp that runs on top of Python. So you can use all of your favorite Python libraries, the whole Python ecosystem, with the added power of a Lisp-based syntax. Um, plus, they have a great mascot, uh, Cuddles the Cuttlefish. <laughs> um, so with Hi, you can use all your Python libraries directly from Hi. Um, and then you can even go and write a Hi file and import those functions and use them from Python. So you can share your Hi code with other Python developers and they won't even know. Um, if this is interesting to you, um, you might want to look at the docs for that. Also, if you're just interested in Lisp in general, um, Peter Norvig has a great how to write a Lisp interpreter in Python project, which is like, I think, 100 lines of Python. And it's really interesting if you want to learn about how um, can, uh, can programming language interpreters work. And if you want to talk more about Lisp, come find me at lunch. I'm always happy to talk about Lisp. Just ask around. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Next on deck, we have Jurgen Brendel. Where are you? Cool. Just okay. yep. come over to the side of the Good stage stuff. so that Ryan can help you out in a sec. This is always the most suspenseful part of any conference. And now we have Tim Bell with Emoji Archaeology 101. Uh, oh. Hello, everyone. So this should be fun. This is Lightning Talk Karaoke, delivering a talk somebody else wrote. Good morning, afternoon, class. Uh, I'm substituting for Dr. McGee today. Sadly, he's come down with a bad case of yak shaving. This is Emoji Archaeology 101. In 1963, the human emotion of happiness was created. It was created by the American Harvey Ross Ball, who was employed to in create an image of a happy face to raise the morale of the employees at an insurance company. <laughs> but once people realized that it was possible to express emotions, they wanted to express emotions of their own. In a New York Times interview in April 1969, Vladimir Nabokov said, I often think there should exist a special typographical sign for a smile, some sort of concave mark, a supine round bracket. In 1982, Scott Fulham had a breakthrough when he proposed the composition of three ASCII characters as a trigraph to express an emotion, happiness. <laughs> Although these code points don't in themselves represent any emotional context, if composed horizontally, they combine to produce a powerful expression which the user can comprehend by simply turning one's head 90 degrees to the left. <laughs> While happiness does have significant utility as an emotion, users felt it was not meeting all their needs. However, by replacing the third code point, the much more functional emotion of unhappiness could be expressed. This ironically led to much higher levels of happiness because users were now able to voice displeasure at everyone who disagreed with them. Thus began a pre-Cambian explosion in the expression of emotion as users realized the hidden potential of the US ASCII code point set. The first changes were simple issues of ergonomics. By reversing the code point order, it was possible to evenly spread the physical exertion required to observe emotion. More sophisticated extensions were also added, such as adornment, wearing glasses, and 
and an optical tiredness from staring deep into the ASCII code chart looking for emotional inspiration. There was also a move to represent more extreme emotions, such as extreme happiness. Some expressions of extremists could be embedded into three glyphs. They required the introduction of a fourth glyph to demonstrate scorn, or to embody a single tear rolling down the face. Some purists felt that the three code point limit should be retained, so they compressed complex emotions by losing the fidelity of nasal expression. <laughs> Others freed themselves of anary constraints, allowing for the rendition of, say, the absurdist philosopher Homer Simpson, or beneficent winter courier Santa Claus. Others revisited the premise of that emotions had to be expressed horizontally and looked to the perpendicular as a presentation style. However, the US ASCII code set was reaching its limit at this point. This led to the introduction of Unicode, providing vastly more alternatives with which to construct even deeper expressions of emotion. <laughs> it is not clear from the literature that any of these glyphs are actually used in the languages of origin. <laughs> the schism between minimalists and maximalists in the expression of emotion reached its zenith in this pair of expressions. 11 character table flip as an ultimate expression of anger <laughs> and a single katakana character as an expression of simple happiness. Unfortunately, pressure was placed upon the Unicode consortium to allow more literal expressions of emotion. This started with, a simple, with simple renditions, but over time, these expressions became more and more literal, removing all subtlety and nuance and indeed beauty from the process of emotional expression, perhaps best demonstrated by the introduction of the pile of poo symbol, allowing scatological references without need to understand what scatological means. <laughs> this has been accompanied by a loss of agency, in the past, users could uh, disruptively innovate and develop their own emotions. But unlike some sort of big brother, I'm sorry, like some sort of big brother, only those emotions approved by the Unicode consortium may be expressed. It doesn't matter if you like drop bears. The consortium, the savage arbiter of sapir wharf hypothesis, had determined that you shall not express that idea. And no longer may we compose symbols to create rich new emotions. Only those comp com compositions approved by the consortium are permitted. So what to do? Some might call for emoji to be eliminated, to be struck from our collective history. But that is defeated. We should fight for our emotions. So rise up, my children. Smash the control emoji. Smash the control machine. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Don't be constrained by the limits placed on you by the consortium. Compose new emotions and express them. Express them deeply and longingly and outwardly. And before someone asks, yes, this will be on the exam. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Tim. So, uh, Curtis, thanks. Where are you? Books. Hi. But before, Tim, did you take a breath? <laughs> <laughs> True lightning talk relay. Are you mind talking? Are you? Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Live demo during lightning talk is what this is implying. Yeah. This is a brave man. So, um, can you can you, can you hear me? All right, excellent. Well, that's a hard talk to follow. Um, all right. Um, mine is much more mundane. I'm going to talk about developer productivity. So, um, as a normal, can you see all right? Okay. I made the font really big. So, this is a normal mm, Python class over there, which you can, can use. You can do things like uh, name, and then you have it. Uh, right? So, you can call a function. Uh, it's also fine, but if you make a typo, then uh, the compiler complains, and that's very annoying because uh, it's very uh, nitpicky. Computers are smart and intelligent these days. Uh, a, planet, uh, a brain the size of a planet, and what do we make it do, right? We make it just go and complain. It should, be just, it should just know what we want to do. It should just do the right thing for us, as I like to say. So, um, so why don't we add a bit of smarts to this? So we 
import a little something I wrote, and then we change our class definition, and we have uh, the same as before. Oops, print. And now, uh, behold the newfound power, because now if we make a uh, simple little typo, it still does the right thing, like <laughs> what exactly what we wanted to happen. Um, Countless hours of developer productivity will be saved this way. Uh, uh, it works the other way around as well. So uh, a name, remember we had this. So uh, let's say we could, uh, something like this equals uh, some, some uh. So now if we say a name, again, it did the right thing, right? So, so clearly, clearly this is, uh, this is an excellent innovation. And I have made this a standard required base class now in my development team. <laughs> so that uh, pesky things like typos and such don't bother us. Because, uh, as you know, a real developer only use, developers only use Vim. We don't rely on IDEs and other uh, annoyances that get in the way. So how was this done? Um, this is, ah, now, this, now my, now the code is too big to, to, because the resolution here, I really apologize about this. It did, looked nicer when the font was a bit smaller, but at least you can read it. Um, so the, uh, this is basically what the get adder does here for us, right? So it uh, does a little magic. It finds similar attributes. This is the base class, by the way, just in case you're wondering. This is the base class, um, which uh, fuzz class it's called, right? So we go to our get, uh, at get adder here. So it basically finds similar sounding names. Now, get adder in Python, yesterday we had an interesting talk about meta. Uh, classes. Um, so you probably, if you were the, there, you saw this. The get adder is called if the attribute that you're asking for can't be found. So you can override this. And that is how you can have classes and attributes of classes which are just dynamically being constructed and used. It's really useful for lots of stuff. So here what we're doing is get adder was called. So somebody typed foobar with the U and uh, couldn't be found, this class gets called, we do find similar attribute names. And if we find one, then we just use that one. And if we look how the find similar attribute names looks like, what it looks like, um, so, uh, where was it? Here, yeah, it's a, it's a longish sort of, it's a longish sort of bit of code, which basically does, uh, iterates over the attributes that it does know about in the class, and then uses a, this class here, fuzzy. I didn't write this, so this is, a, this is a Python module. You can just pip install fuzzy, and it has different algorithms available to find out whether or not things sound the same. So, it, uh, so, so you can, uh, so name with a capital A, a name with many A's sounds the same as name with just one A. So uh, you can use your, your, this, these algorithms there to find attributes or other strings that sound the same. Really interesting if you want to just do some fuzzy sort of text matching. So um, yeah, anyway, that's behind the scenes. But, uh, but as you can tell, you can use these things to some really useful uh, uh, effect. And I hope that uh, there's a, oh yeah, there's a, maybe I should show this. There is actually a, uh, there's a, I have a GitHub repo for it. Uh, there are no tests, unfortunately. But <laughs> I, I did this. I did this in. I did this in 2014, and then um, yesterday I thought maybe I should port it to Python 3. So I did that. So, uh, but yeah. So it's there, and you can look at the source code. Maybe you can actually. I should have shown this. It's actually nicer to probably see here now. So yeah. See, it actually looks normal, not chaotic. And so you can find see what it does there. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Jürgen. Martin Smith, come on down. This is good. Thank you. Thanks, 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 thanks. thanks. Oh. Sorry, I just mm -hmm. this. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I get everyone to give all the speakers so far a big round of applause? They've done really well. Didn't work so well that time. Power when I can. Oh. Thank you. Okay, up next we have Martin Smith, but first we have Curtis with 
what the post-it note says is that damned question from last night. Uh, so who was there last night at the trivia? Do you, does anyone think they know which question I'm talking about? <laughs> you know, that one about inheritance. So there are a few people who are a little confused about it and I went and dug into it because I remember having to explain this to a class once before. So the rule is essentially if C1 precedes C2 in the linearization of C, then C1 precedes C2 in the linearization of all subclasses of C. Does that make sense to anyone? Easy. Yeah. Oh, good. So I'm done. Right. No. Um, sorry. Oops. Sorry. Not used to having to do this. So this is what we had last night. And we were asked, if I ask, create an instance of D, what's D dot name going to be? And the problem was that people put A, people put C, and of course it was A. But why? So this is to do with linearization, which is a depth first search left to right of your subclasses, uh, except for shared parents, because that causes the problem. So if we look here, we've got A actually inherits from object, because everything inherits from object. B inherits A from object, C inherits from object. So if we look at D, which goes to B, so when we do our depth first search, we look at our first parent, and that's B, and then B goes to A, and A is not shared by anyone else, so then it goes to O. So that's why we find name is A, because we get to A straight away. Then if we didn't, then we'd move on to C, and then object is shared by all of them, so it would be the last one checked. What the problem was, was people were thinking, I forgot my own slides, people were thinking that it was this, where B inherits from A and C inherits from A, and that would create a very different graph, because we'd get to here. So as we go from D and we look up B, and we go B's parent is A, but A is shared by C, so we can't look at it yet, because otherwise we'd get weird ordering on things. So we're going to answer C, and C has the answer we want, so we'll stop looking. Otherwise, then we would go to A, and finally on to O. Is this making sense? You can't go and look at the parent class if it is shared by another subclass that you are, or class that you are deriving from. Um, so again, here's the demonstration. We go from D to C to B to A and then O and then we're done. And if you want to read the actual explanation of the algorithm, which is quite followable, that's the URL you need. Thank you very much. <laughs> Two will be on the exam. Uh, up next, we have Andrew Bartlett. Come on down, make yourself known to Ryan. Bop, 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 bop. can do it. And now we have Martin Smith with any color you like. You have five minutes starts now. This is all your fault. Okay. So, so much is. Yeah. Um, when I was like 15 years younger and knew everything, I, uh, I used Vim, I wrote Perl. Um, every, everything was fantastic. Um, and I, I really disliked magic and, and I thought I was lazy um, because that's one of the virtues of a Perl program, but, but um, I wasn't lazy. And um, I always used to work on reasonably small teams, and uh, one, of the, one of the problems I found, um, well, w one of the problems we solved very easily was that we could, um, we could talk amongst ourselves, we could decide on conventions, we could, you know, we could all agree on how we were gonna do things. And it was great. Um, you know, fast forward 15 years, I'm, I'm now working for a company, and um, our team is growing, we have about, 50, uh, we have about uh, nine people working on a, you know, on a code base now, and, um, what used to be really easy, we, we, we could just chat to like, you know, a couple of people and decide how we were going to do things. That doesn't really happen anymore. And so, and we get a lot of people and, and they, they, they do things differently and it, it starts to become a bit of a problem. So one of the things that Daniel was talking about in the uh, keynote this morning was consistency. And um, I've, uh, I've really started embracing consistency. And one of, the, one of the ways that I do that now is um, I started using Prettier. So um, some smart people I know said I should start using Prettier. I don't know how many of you have heard of that. It's a tool for JavaScript or TypeScript. And it basically says, given a piece of source code written by anyone whatsoever, 
this is canonically how it should be represented. So it, it'll re-indent it, it'll move braces around, it'll do all sorts of stuff. And the first time I looked at it, I really disliked it. Um, it, it did everything differently to me. And one of the things that I learned, uh, I learned to live with was actually I, I prefer I prefer something that I don't really like. Uh, sorry, I prefer the consistency of it always being that way over the, uh, you know, my personal preference and the fact that some, sometimes everything wasn't my personal preference. So uh, I've also learned, uh, you know, in the past year or so about a tool called Black. Um, it's, a, it's a Python library that does exactly this for Python. Disclaimer, I'm not actually using it yet, but um, I hope to be very soon. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. There we go. So these, these are just some examples of, um, I, I literally wrote this like 20 minutes ago. So, but the, the, this is an example of like the same code a few times. You know, somebody might write something that looks like this. Um, I don't even know what this is. Um, and in particular, I, I really dislike this add stuff thing. Um, I, I use PyCharm now, and um, it does that, and I really dislike it. But uh, if you take any bit of code that looks like this, it's, it's the same code all the time, and black says it should look like this. And I, I don't necessarily agree that that's perfect, but um, it, it is really consistent, and if everybody is using this and you have something in your pipeline that ensures that this is the case, um, then all your code will always look the same, and, and it makes it much easier to read. Um, and and I, I think this is something that if you had told me 10 years ago, I would have laughed, but I, I do think consistency is better than your personal preference, and, and I think that's my main takeaway here. Um, there are no questions. You should all use black. Thank you, Martin. And you're right, black is awesome. So coming up next, we have Andrew Bartlett with What Am I Doing Here Anyway? So, yeah. Um, I'm a Samba developer, so what am I doing here anyway? Um, and basically, um, so I want to talk about Samba and Python. So Samba needed a scripting language to, you know, template out, provision up a new Active Directory DC, do some useful stuff. So naturally, we chose JavaScript. Um, and this was before the, you know, Node.js thing. This was EJS. Um, and then, not just set up, we thought we'd use it for tests as well. So we got more JavaScript, and, um, and then we needed a build system. Uh, so, of course, it was a shell, M4, and Perl, um, and a test system, so more Perl. And then a template generation uh, system, so we were generating up all the structures to talk on our network protocols from IDL files, so, well, Perl again. Um, so, what's this about Python, then? Uh, well, so Python apparently came with batteries included, so we moved across to Python. Our Perl generator uh, generates C uh, bindings for the Python uh, for all of our network calls. So suddenly, anything you can express in a C structure, in uh, C-like structure in these IDL files, suddenly becomes a Python accessible object. They move all of our tests and, and, and things across to Python. And finally, the build system. Um, now, we, we now use WAF, which is a Python-based build system, universally loathed by the Samba team, but you know, it seems to build Samba sufficiently well. So naturally, we're a C-based project that you know, writes some stuff in Python. Um, we're not exactly committed to the Python cores. It's more a tool that we use to, towards it. So we loved uh, being moved across to Python 3. That was, um, that was a true joy. Um, I'm so glad we got some help. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, but, you know, we are perhaps unique in that we're probably one of the few projects that has simultaneously supported Python 2.6 and 3.6 in a single release. Um, thankfully, it's all Python 3 now. Uh, but um, what we would really do, could do with some help with is some help from someone who actually knows Python and not just Douglas uh, to actually help us write, well, Python and not just C using, you know, no curly braces. So if you, if, if you think the systems programming might happen to be your thing and, or you just take sheer pity upon us, then, uh, then please, the Samba project could use your help. Um, and other than that, um, 
yeah, you know, and I've actually enjoyed being uh, our move to Python. I, I, I jest at it, but we actually have a significant number of our tools written in it now, and um, we even do occasionally get some contributions to it. So anyway, that's why I'm here. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> On deck after Graham, we have Chelsea. But first, we have Graham Dumpleton who's going to provide us some more evil. Okay. Um, yesterday, uh, Curtis, or Funky Bob, as everyone knows him, did a talk on, which was very meta. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. Uh, he talked about how one, instead of using meta classes, can use some new features in Python 3.7 to override the behavior when accessing classes. Now, that is interesting to me because I produce a package called Wrapped. Uh, now, how many people here are knowingly using Wrapped? Well, hardly any. Wrapped, it was the last time I looked, was between the 60th and 70th most popular downloaded package on the Python package index in that month. And that's actually an inaccurate fi figure because it's bundled inside of New Relic and Datadog packages, which meant it was closer to 50, one behind Flask. So the fact that no one here is hardly using it, you should, because it must be really good if it's downloaded that many times. OK, so what is it? It's a library for implementing decorators um, and also a whole lot of horrible stuff with monkey patching, which is why Datadog and New Relic use it. What is interesting about it is it enables, enables, enables you to write what's called a universal decorator. It's a decorator where you can provide one implementation which you can apply to a function, a global method in a class, a instance method or a class method or a class. And you can tell within the decorator the context in which it is used in. And that means you can only provide one implementation and actually change what it does depending on the context it's used. There's a problem. If you use a decorator on a class and you do this, so I have a base, I have my decorator defined, my decorator. I apply that to a base class. I then derive a class from that base class. I create an instance of my base class. That will work fine. If I create an instance of my derived class, I get an error. A really weird error, and I don't know why it produces that error. Uh, I've never, and actually, this error is a bit different in 3.7 compared to older. Um, the workaround has been to do this: is to tell people to access an attribute of what looks like the derived class to get to the real, actual class. Now, the reason it's not the class is because when you apply the decorator, it's wrapping it in an object, and so it's actually deriving from an instance of something, an instance of a class. And that's why it blows up. So PEP 560 is the one that uh, uh, Funky Bob was talking about, introduced in Python 3.7. Uh, the thing that he talked about in that was this special underscore method called class get item, which allows you to override accessing member or attributes of a class to do stuff. It actually has another one in there, un and underscore MRO entries. This actually allows you to intercept funny things when doing derivation. And it turns out it's actually useful to me. The way that the decorator is implemented is actually as a class instance. So I'm creating my decorator, decorator actually underneath is using this thing called a function wrapper. Well, I can actually now go back and solve my problem using what I've learned from Funky Bob by adding to my function wrapper this MRO, en MRO entries underscore method and I can grab the information at once from the thing that was being wrapped. And so I can then have my base class. Uh, so I've written the equivalent here now. The idea is I'll roll this back in, and it will be part of the, the deck wrapped, and you won't know about it. And I'll be able to do my derivation class, and it will work, all magic. So thanks to Funky Bob, I learned something new uh, at this conference, and I hope whenever you come to the conferences, you do learn something new. It's always a great opportunity. So thank you, Funky Bob. And thank you, Graham. Uh, on deck next, we have Phoenix Zarin. Where are you? Can you make yourself known? Go. Cool. And we need someone to sub in on AV because our AV is about to give it up. <laughs> oh, Ryan, you're being kicked out of your own job. Thank you, Chelsea. Take it away. Cool. Awesome. Um, 
Hi. Uh, this is a uh, not so technical talk, I guess. Well, it probably does apply to technical things. Um, you might want to care about it. I don't know. Up to you. Anyway, um, this is my talk um, about me, uh, why I'm going to do this. Um, I'm trans feminine, uh, I guess. Uh, was a scientist things at birth, and now I decided to do a different thing. Um, Non-binary, if uh, anyone's curious, and uh, those are my pronouns. I like those things. Um, anyway, uh, so the point of this talk is effectively kind of summarizing uh, Opal's talk from uh, PyCon AU. Um, really, uh, when you're dealing with like things like gender and sex and stuff, in terms of like forms, uh, Kinda, well, I don't know, it, it don't. Um, but like, if you do, like, you, I mean, you probably, probably really don't need to, but like, if you really have to, like, make that stuff like a fillable field, because, you know, like, it, it, the, the world is a bit more complex than just like male and female, man and woman and stuff, like, th there's a whole lot more to it, and, like, you could try and list everything out, but uh, frankly, it's just going to be too hard. Make it fillable, um, or at least add that in there. Um, otherwise, it just kind of makes uh, people, like, well, my, my life hard, really. I, it just annoys me. Um, but, like, seriously, though, why, why do you have to get this information? Like, what are you doing? Like, you know, um, like, it, yeah, anyway. Um, in terms of, like, pronouns and stuff, like, when you just want to use them in day-to-day -day activities, this is probably more just, like, an in-person thing and con stuff, but, like, they, them is a good default, like, uh, and if you ever have a problem, like, if you think singular they is weird, like, take, take the, you know, uh, scenario where, like, someone's at the door, like, they're like, oh, look, someone's at the door, um, and then you go, well, what do they want? You know, like, you just used it singularly, so you know, do that. Um, but, like, don't just use it for people like myself. Like, kind of just use it for everyone, I guess, as a blanket term. Like, because if you just start using it for every, like, everyone who looks like me and stuff, then that's just kind of just treating us differently, and I don't like that. Um, also, use the name as well. That works. Um, I don't see where that doesn't work. Um, yeah, do that. And um, don't be mean about it. Like, you know, if, if, if you're kind of getting a little bit caught up on doing this kind of thing, don't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, that's, that's kind of kind of the point that I was trying to get across. Um, really, this is just like some self-indulgent stuff. Um, and if you have any questions about this kind of thing, because it's kind of really hard to talk about in like five minutes, um, come approach me, because um, yeah, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of it. Yeah, go. Cool. Thank you very much, Chelsea. Will Conley, can you come down and get set up? Coming up next, we have Phoenix Zarin with, I love working on open source, but not in my spare time. Credits for background image right away. Thank you. Oh, right. Yeah. Take it away. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Cool. Um, actually, before I start, I want to do something kind of annoying. Um, I just kind of noticed this. And I thought it's really neat. Um, that's a kiwi, which is really cool. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. I've been looking at it for two days. What? Well, yeah. Anyway. Okay. So yeah. So title of the talk: I love working on open source, but not in my spare time because, quite frankly, that's very true. Um, so this is, um, I volunteer at uh, Inspiral Dev Academy. It's a developer boot camp. I'm there twice a week uh, to mentor the students. I also coach them after graduation. And when they graduate, I also do a little presentation. So this is a part of, uh, well, this is actually part of a, a talk I did at a recruiting agency. Um, and I could do one for your organization, by the way. Um, but this, this slide here is one that I like to show them. So these are all the open source projects that I've worked on, created, what have you. Um, there's a small list at the top of things that I actually worked on in my spare time. The rest of them, I was paid to do them in some capacity. And if you look at the ones also that I worked on in my spare time, they're all mostly related to IOTA. So uh, actually, they're all related to blockchain technology. So before I came to New Zealand, um, I was working at a fintech company in Peru. And everyone there was keen on blockchain. I wanted to get into it. Uh, couldn't quite find a project that we could justify putting resources towards. And so I kind of said, OK, a few nights and weekends, the rest of my career. 
let's do it. And so at the time, the IOTA cryptocurrency was looking for someone to write their Python library, and I was like, yeah, I could probably do that. And uh, somehow I convinced them to let me do it. Six months of mornings and weekends later, uh, Pyota was born. Uh, the IOTA cryptocurrency later went on to become the ninth largest cryptocurrency in the world. I take full credit for that. Um, <laughs> but when I came to New Zealand, then there was a company called Centrality that was like a blockchain venture studio, and they basically had already heard of me. Um, I'm probably making myself sound a little better than actually happened, but um, so be it. And the, so what I want to focus on is, um, as part of this talk, I like to say that a, a developer boot camp, it's kind of like we put you in a wagon at the top of a hill, we give you a push, there's a ramp at the bottom, and the rest is up to you. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges that they have is how do they keep their skills up after they graduate because they're no longer sat in a room and forced to code. And once they enter the workforce, again, like myself, look, when I get home, the last thing I want to do is think about coding. And so I found some ways where essentially I can get paid to work on open source. And so they kind of look like this. So for people that actually do like this sort of thing, um, having people to hack with is a lot of fun. Um, I gave this talk at EDA, so fellow alumni. Um, but also, if you do go to meetups, I know NZ Python User Group has basically hacking nights. So if that's your thing, you can do that. Also, hackathons are great. Uh, I like sleep, so I don't do those. But um, also, what's really worked well for the students in particular is they start a personal project that's very meaningful to them. Um, whether it's something, so there was one student, when they, when they created their personal project, their partner used it every day and they got feedback from their partner every single day. And so that gave them a lot of uh, motivation to keep going with it. Um, or something that has real users. Um, also, we do a lot of contribution to open source libraries. I do this a lot as part of my job. So whenever we come up with some functionality and it's looking really cool, I say, hey, this is pretty generic. I take it to my manager and say, hey, we could actually make this an open source project. And my manager is thinking, oh, geez, where are we going to find more senior Python talent in New Zealand? There's like none around well, hey, let's put this out there. We can raise our profile and attract some really good developers. And it even got to the point where at one point I made a contribution back to MongoDB. Um, they declined it, but <laughs> <laughs> I have it out there now. And it actually is a really neat, it's a neat uh, way to, uh, if you use MongoDB, you actually can't put dollar signs or dots in the names of keys in your documents. And this is a way where essentially you don't have to think about it. It escapes them for you. Um, also, I would say, um, if uh, you do release an open source project, do make sure that someone is available to take it over uh, if you do leave the organization. Um, this one didn't go so well, so uh, this was that fintech company in Peru, and by the way, if somebody is watching, I'm just going to put that up there. Um, anyway, so that is pretty much it. Um, as I said, look for ways you can integrate it into your work. One of my favorite things to do is we're all tempted. We are using an open source library, and it doesn't quite do what we want it to. And so we're very tempted just to hack around it because it's a lot faster. Uh, some of my best open source contributions have been, hey, instead of hacking around this, let's just dive in and fix it, and then maybe submit a pull request. It takes about as much time. Uh, and again, it just raises your company's profile in the development community. So that's it. Um, I don't have a thing, but I did want to put this up there. So for those of you that didn't get the motorcycle helmet, com helmet comment from my talk yesterday, um, that's me. You'll probably see me around Auckland. So thanks. Thank you, Phoenix. Take this opportunity to give Ryan a massive round of applause because he has the busiest job right now. And now we have Will Conley. Take it away. Thank you. Um, going to get into a, a data uh, geoscience application here. Uh, shift gears a little bit. And, um, Specifically today, I wanted to just share something with you that I worked on um, regarding river movements and hazards. And um, if the third line of code makes sense to you, then you can ignore the top two. Um, otherwise, I've defined rivers and humans. But the idea being is that if we, um, rivers are just rivers. And we don't have hazards until the humans show up. And, um, but then the, the scale of the hazard um, is, a, is a variable. And so in this case, um, because the angry phone calls start showing up for the managers when a, about a meter of bank has been eroded, um, 
we'll just define a, a meter as sort of our, our threshold variable if you just kind of keep that in the back of your, your minds through the rest of the talk. <clears throat> and so um, we can try and understand the present and predict the future from the past, because of course that's where our data lies. And um, aerial photo time series are something we use quite a lot of. Um, but they come in different um, forms, they have different uh, histories of handling, and many of you can relate to this if you're ever using inherited data, whatever sort of field you're working in. Um, not all data stewards um, are equally competent or um, uh, engaged in precision and accuracy, um, or they might be, but they have just very different objectives or intent with that particular data. Until your project comes along and somebody says, oh yeah, this other guy was working on this, you should just use whatever he did. And then you see, because you're working on rivers, but there's also this thing called the conservation of mass and energy, where, where ri real rivers can't actually do this, right? But that, there's your data. Um, and so you go through your photographic time set. In this case, I've got a, a reference year, which is the big photo on the one side, and um, four other years that I was comparing it to. And ideally, all those colors of dots stack up. And we can see that they don't. And we can see that that red one in particular is like off by like 130 meters, which is actually, if the river were there, that's wider than the river is wide, right? So um, before we proceed with our analysis, maybe we, we should take a deeper look into data quality in terms of uh, suitability or fitness for purpose. Um, and the big problem there being, I work, uh, I've been working with geospatial stuff for 20 years now, um, and some of the software is quite fancy, quite expensive, um, but it doesn't always do what you want to, as it turns out, even though this was really simple um, vector math. Uh, so I decided to jump into it, make my own, and um, it was a bit painful at times, but um, in terms of questions of suitability, we can be interested in things like magnitude and, and spatial distribution, right? And um, so in this case, again, I have my, my four years of comparison, and then it's just all just, you know, basically symbolization. And um, we see that actually three of those years, we probably uh, need to revisit the actual registration on those, um, those bits of data. The other thing that's really interesting is that the standard metric of error which is usually reported in the scientific literature is this RMSE, which is an averaged uh, spatial metric, um, only accounts for about 35% of the magnitude of the error, which means that um, even if you're okay with an error of like 16 or 18 meters, there's stuff lurking out there that's, that's 50 plus meters that a lot of people don't recognize. So is it correctable, right? Maybe you've got some large errors. Is it correctable? Maybe it's just a datum transformation. Well, you use something like quiver or, or you know, arrows, something like that. Um, and we see that the, the vector magnitude and directions all over the place. And so this bit, at this point then, for this particular data set, it's start over. Which I won't get into the process of how I took data that looked like that top one, which previous investigators had uh, you know, just gone about in the GIS and clicked the, the river margins along, which is that orange line, and come up with this bottom graphic um, showing the original lines that show an additional 30 meters of bank erosion that, um, or, or channel movement, if you will, that was not reflected in the original data set, right? Hence, let's say if we were using that for some sort of retrospective or even forecasting analysis, right, from a... Um, without validating it, um, the phone calls start running, rolling in. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Patton Simpson, time for you to come downstairs. But first we have Sue. Hi, everyone. Um, so I don't know for you, but I have a severe case of imposter syndrome, so I don't like to talk about nearly the subject, and instead I'm going to talk about how to use your nerdy subject for anything. So here comes a code challenge. Uh, the idea of a code challenge is that sometimes you want to 
write a piece of code which doesn't necessarily have a function for projects or something, but just do something fancy. So if you ever write, run this piece of code inside your browser, for example, this will output this piece of code. This is called a queen. It's um, when you write a function or a piece of code that output itself. Um, now, the general idea of that is, for example, here you can use a two-string method of our function in JavaScript to get the source of a function. Um, general idea of this is that you may want to combine it with some other little challenges, like, for example, you might want to have a Golang program that output a Rust program, which outputs the original Golang program. And exploring those kind of options is kind of maybe kind of fun for you and kind of help you having discovering quirks in your language. Um, other thing I've wrote pretty recently was to have um, a source file that is actually valid in multiple languages. So this works in Perl, and this works in C. Uh, could have improved it a little bit, but yeah. Uh, once again, it helps you understand the structure of your code and like, just write some little funny stuff. And the last example of code I'm going to give you is a bit of brand fuck. So this, for any input string you give it, will output the, um, will output the, in, the string with every character doubled. So for those who understand brand fuck, like it's literally read a character, start a loop, output twice a character you have stored, then read another character, and if there is a character, just loop again. Um, Yes, so Katy made a presentation about language quirks in general. Uh, it's kind of a little extension of what you can do as a programming challenge for that, using what she showed you previously. Uh, and that's all. Thanks for listening. Thank you. We have powered through about 14 or 15 talks, so uh, cool. Not totally sure about the handwriting here. Uh, Shane Ramsey, Sean Ramsey, come on down. Sorry. Uh, is that a Glenn? Oh, that might be a Glenn. Glenn Ramsey. Come on down. <laughs> Looks like an S. <laughs> um, Sue also, by the way, gets the prize for the neatest handwriting on Post-it notes. So, credit, credit there. I could read your handwriting. I could read your handwriting. It was great. <laughs> um, I could barely read yours. <laughs> uh, take it away, Grant. OK, can you hear me? Yep. OK, Python and big data. Um, when we're setting up our stack, you'd hear things sometimes like, Python isn't enterprise. You should be using Java. Or Python is slow. What about Scala? And according to some people, Python shouldn't be able to fly in the big data space. And yet it flies. In fact, it flies really well at Curious, which is the company I work for. We use Python for all our location intelligence data. And that's data from 2 million devices every day, which generate 400 million mobile events daily, which is a lot of data. And that's 150 billion records a year. So as far as big data goes, Curious is the real deal. And we rely on Python very heavily for our production data pipeline and our analytical systems. So here's an example of some code. Um, there's a little bit of boilerplate at the top. And then the main thing is it's just an ordinary Python function, which can call on other Python, function, um, other Python functions, modules, and libraries, like Pandas or whatever you want. So yeah. If you need more speed, you can try just more nodes. Um, so we're using uh, Amazon EMR. Elastic MapReduce, and another option which I get a lot of benefit from is just optimizing the SQL when I'm gathering the data together before I process it. I can make things uh, enormously faster just by doing that. And then finally, maybe the algorithm you're using is just not the best algorithm, so you can work on improving that. So there's typically no need to switch out of Python. All things being equal, it's, it's, good not, it's not good to increase the number of languages that you need to support in your organization. Um, the guy who knew Scala, well, we've got one left, but he's busy, and the other one left. So there's no waiting for code to be ported into Scala or Java, 
And this is really cool here. Our data scientists can share a Git repository with the big data engineers and the architecture and engineering team. So there's one Python code base to rule them all. So we can do pull requests and so on, code review. So that leaves a whole lot more time to optimize our code for performance, uh, sophistication, actually making it do more clever things, and maintainability. That is so we know how it worked and you know, whether we can add more features without getting confused. But this is the, the big one. There's much, much, much more willingness to experiment and push the boundaries now that we've sort of made the, um, we're using Python for all that. So if you want agile data science in the big data space, don't worry about agile buzzword compliance. Uh, use Python. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Grant. We are down to our final four talks. Um, everyone just cheer again for how amazing these have been so far. Please just... <laughs> David Hunter, come on downstairs, get set up. But first, we have Glenn Ramsey with solar power monitoring. Take it away, Glenn. Um, so, um, I'll, get, I'll get myself a better slide. So, why isn't that working? So, we um, recently moved to a, oh, you can see that. We recently moved to a, a, a property that doesn't have any mains power. It's off the grid, so we're, we're totally on solar. And, um, and it's got a, you can just see in this picture, there's a couple of rows of panels. At the back there, there's a, um, uh, a white shed. In that shed there's a giant battery and that's what our, our house runs on. So um, when we first moved in there was no, um, um, no way of telling what the battery charge level was. You had to go outside and go in the shed and look on a tiny little display and maybe you even had to push a button to wake it up so that it would show you something and um, um, that was of course very inconvenient. So uh, we eventually contacted the supplier and I just need to put this down to Still didn't. Oh, anyway, we'll get, we'll get the gist of it. Um, so then eventually, after a few weeks, we connect the supplier of the system and they, they commissioned this thing called a web box, which is, you can just see that the cut off the screen there, um, which we were able to access by our, from our local LAN. So um, um, it turns out that um, that is, is, is awful because the only information you want to know is how much battery have I got left. So to do that, you have to log in you have to click on a button, you have to click on another button, and after like logging in and three clicks, you finally get the information you wanted in the first place. So I had a look at it and went, actually you can talk to this, in one of these screens there's, there's a thing that says Modbus TCP, and I thought, ah, we can do something with that. So I, um, I had a look at that, and um, it turns out it doesn't work like they, uh, like they said it would. Uh, but, the, but the supplier said, look, also it does, it has a, um, um, a JSON RPC interface, or a REST a JSON REST interface. So I had a look at that, and it turned out that that actually works. And so um, I, I'll go back to the screen that was originally up. So, so what I've done now is I have a display, and you might recognize this as Grafana. And when you, when you log into this from the LAN on your phone or on the, on the TV computer or where, whenever, the, the very first thing you see is the battery percentage. Now, I've put a whole bunch of other information on that too because it was available and because Grafana lets you do that, it's, it's really easy. So, um, and you can see some interesting stuff, like at, at the moment, this is live. So, um, you can see um, I'm accessing it through localhost because I've got a secure shell tunnel to, to my house. So we can see the battery is 80%, which is great because it's like, you know, it's like Hubbard's 12, so we've still got like three hours of charge, maybe we can get up to 95. Um, our system, the maximum capacity is, is five kilowatts. So um, 4.61 means it's, uh, it's not, not bright sun, but it's, it's sort of like a little bit of wispy cloud. Um, the other thing I, I report here is the battery percentage, uh, because um, the battery uh, state of charge algorithm is hopeless, so it's handy to just 
have, an, have your eye on that when, when the battery charge algorithm tells you you've only got 20% left. When you look at the voltage, you go, no, I'm pretty sure I haven't. So um, um, the way that I did that was, oh, wrong one. Um, I've got a Raspberry Pi 3 in my pantry because that's where the Ethernet cable comes out. Uh, that, that just goes directly to, the, to that web box thing. Then I've got a Wi-Fi Ethernet bridge just so that I could um, um, have them both on the same subnet because otherwise you can, you can make a router in the Raspberry Pi but then it's on a different subnet and it's just you can't get to it from anywhere else. It's difficult. Um, so the, the, um, I have a Prometheus client running on that thing and it, it requests the JSON via the request library from the web box and then the way that Prometheus works is that it just looks at an, an HTTP endpoint which is running locally on the box and that, that pulls the JSON data off uh, it pulls the JSON data off the web box, it exports it to Prometheus, Prometheus stores it in its database, database however it does, and then um, Grafana gets the data from Prometheus, and then you go into Grafana and uh, by, um, just manually configure the, all the bits and bobs you want. So, um, and it, it's, it's worked great. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Leon Bowie, can you come down and get set up? Could be the end of the lightning talk. No, no, no. Hyperspace. <laughs> Hang on, I can fix this. I can fix this. Ah, broken internet. <laughs> We have a talk on a screen. Yeah, right. Pretty easy to that way if you have to see them. So if you go back to your displays. The suspense. Uh, Can I drive your laptop? Yep, let's drive it. Everyone get ready to go ooh as soon as it's on screen. Not yet. Almost. <laughs> awesome. Starts now. Hi, I'm David Hunter. Um, I was going to call this lightning talk uh, hip flask. Um, I had an amazing idea at 11 o'clock last night when I was really drunk that I would start a lightning talk. So um, if the code doesn't look right, there's a good reason. Um, so the talk's actually about deploying flask into AWS Lambda because I, I kind of think it's the easiest thing you could do and if I can do it drunk and I can present it to you, I've proven my point. Okay. Okay, so I'll just run through it really quickly. This is a folder layout for um, a basic Flask template. Um, we, we'd have some Flask template folder. Um, the app, obviously, which is a Flask app. The only other things you're looking at is package JSON, which is something that's generated by um, uh, the serverless package. So I'm using um, serverless to generate my Lambda functions. Um, and the serverless description at the bottom and a standard requirements file and a readme. So I'll flick into the Flask app, which is kind of pretty simple. This is all just doing requests, getting the URL, and returning result. Flask should be pretty simple to you. Um, and this is the package file that's generated by the serverless um, node pr program. So um, the only thing I'm doing in here is effectively adding in um, a serverless Python requirements and a whiskey installation. So I'll show you the readme at the end, and we can run through that. Really pushing through things really quickly. This is serverless defining a function that's going to be up there, what plugins it's got at the top, um, a bunch of role statements which give you permissions to do things, and the important stuff's kind of at the bottom where we, des we describe our function. Um, so in this case, we're, we're actually proxying everything through um, AWS API Gateway into 
um, into Flask. And then right at the bottom, our custom whiskey app is just defining where we're finding our Flask app. Um, and probably the, the very second to last line, which says Dockerize pip, is probably the most important thing, because what that does is when we build our requirements, um, it actually fires up a copy of the ADLS um, environment and builds all the pip requirements in that in order to push them up. So everything's done in the native um, image of AWS Lambda. So I will go back, and hopefully I can bring up a copy of my readme file. Um, so I'll just run through this really quickly. It's from, the, from top to bottom. This is how, what I did last night when I was drunk. Um, NPN in, install my serverless group. Uh, I create my, create my folders. Um, this NPN in it creates my JSON package. Added a couple of extra lines to it. Um, created a virtual environment. I use virtual environment wrapper just because I'm lazy. Um, did my pip installs manually so I could test it locally. Um, uh, this npm run setup, that just ran that JavaScript file that I, the JSON file, sorry, that I showed you earlier. Uh, and then I type deploy. So I guess the easiest option is to just show you what it does. So if I just click deploy in the folder, this is effectively everything that happens straight after I've typed all that. Now this would be the longest part of the process. So has anyone actually used AWS Lambda? Got some figures? Lots of people. Have you used serverless as a framework? Right. So this, this pretty much covers what you do, you think? Or there could be a different ways to, to use serverless. There's the SAM templates that AWS it produces itself, but I found that the serverless framework gave me a lot more features um, and allows me to produ produce a production lambda in about two hours to production. So that's now deployed it. It's given me a URL at the top. Um, with a couple of extra plugins, you can have that automatically append to existing domain names and, and it creates C names on your domain to push to that. So the last step is, let's go along and, what's the bit? I have lost it. Oh, there we go. There's the URL. And let's pop it up. It should come up with an answer. There we go. <laughs> Chuck Norris. Yeah, there you go. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you, David. After this. Coming up now, we have Leon Bowie with MicroPython. Almost. Nah. Tell you the truth, it's not me doing the magic. Shh. We can pretend. Insecure magicians might. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have some. Uh, yeah, uh, we've got recursion. Wow, huh. we've got a lot of recursion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Leon, 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 and Leon, and yeah, Leon. Yeah, no, just you get Go. limited Leon now. Amazing. Um, so pretty much there was a talk yesterday by Glenn. He was introducing pretty much MicroPython just on the ESP boards running Wi-Fi on them. So instead of having to go through the pain of coding them in C, you can use some nice Python to code them. He then issued at the end of it a nice challenge of if you get to play with the toys if you do a talk about them. So here I am. I played with the toys, so here's my punishment. So pretty much what um, I discovered is apart from the pain of trying to install software on a Mac through Linux not work booting up on it, um, it works, albeit interestingly. So here's his original project. You've got the sound sensor on there, and then if you make a lot of noise, different LEDs come up. The slight differences are you've got a nice LCD, 
can, does that actually shine? Um, no, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if screens decide to stay on. And pretty much, I had another one. It connected to Wi-Fi. It published to the internet, and then it broke five minutes ago. So that doesn't work. So pretty much all I've just learned and really all I want to talk about is how even though I never knew there was Python, it's just keep looking around. If you decide you like Django, look at alternatives and just keep looking at other things as well and just keep looking at it. Because sometimes it works really well, sometimes it breaks and just keep playing and experimenting because why else are we all here? So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Leon, 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 and Leon. Good Leon. And our final lightning talk, Ben Bradshaw. In three, two, ish. <laughs> One and a bit. Point seven four. Four oh four. Always harder to type when you've got an entire crowd watching you. Oh yeah. Ooh. Cool. All right. <laughs> Go Ben. Your time starts now. Cheers. Hi everyone. Um, so my name's Ben. I'm a developer. I've been writing code for about ten years. Most of that's been um, PHP. After that, I did about three years of Ruby on Rails, and I'm about a year into Python. Um, so I just wanted to sort of like. I reflected on a couple of things I've heard over the past couple of days, and I was just thinking about how, just how much magic is in languages. It's just there, but it's not discoverable, or you sort of see a big glimpse of it, and then it just vanishes, and you don't actually use it anywhere else. Um, because I've made the transition between languages twice in the past five years, I'm feeling like pretty confident about how I will do it for me. It's going to be different for everybody, but I found that if you can find the magic in a language and use it, it can be incredibly powerful. Not only can it actually make your code better and smarter and easier to read, and it can make your peers happier, it can make your clients happier because you're taking less time to write your code and you're delivering more story points faster and better. It can also make your life a lot easier, and that's kind of the main thing I want to talk about, is if you can invest your time in learning the language, um, then you can actually have an easier time writing your code. It takes less of your mental energy, and that way you actually finish work at the end of a day with more energy to go and do the things outside of work that you actually enjoy doing more. Um, so the reason I put this down as a thing to talk about is because this conference is the first time in my sort of eight, nine, ten months of writing Python that I've heard the word dunder. I haven't read it. I've, I've dealt with, I've, I was calling it underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, string, um, to use these kinds of things. And the word dunder didn't come up. I had to put my hand up. And I was like, like what is that? And then I Googled it. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> There's so many of these. And another one, another talk was about like meta stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've used meta classes in Django. You go class meta, and then you write some stuff down. That's not it. <laughs> but it it's been wonderful to get this experience this weekend. And all of you who've come out, you've sacrificed time on your weekend. And kudos to you for coming out and doing something like this. And my encouragement is mostly just for, um, for people who are maybe more junior or for people who are transitioning languages. Um, this is one of those things that gets easier if you're completely head covered and you're just sitting there trying to get your jobs on, trying to get your code finished, trying to make sure that you know your client's happy and you're stressed and you're overloaded. You don't have time at work to go ahead and be like, well, actually, I'm going to take half a day out and read two scoops of Django or like read up on blogs or documentation or all of that stuff. I get that. It sucks. It's hard. What I really recommend you do, and it's something that I need to do more of, is study in your own time, and that can kind of suck. You can feel like, well, why am I working for free, basically? And that was my mentality for a while. But when it comes down to it, the more you know and the better you get at your craft, the easier your craft becomes, the faster you get at things, and the more time you free up to do other stuff. And you don't need to tell 
your project manager that you're doing things a lot faster. If you complete something like a three-point story, <laughs> you complete a three-point story in a day because you know the ins and outs of the language that you're dealing with, you can give yourself an hour to read more documentation, read Pep A, it's everything else. Like, it will ultimately make you a better developer. It will make the people you work with happier with your code. It'll make you more relaxed. And if you're stressed, you're not very creative. And creative brains are the kinds of brains we need to have to solve the problems that we're trying to solve in this. If we're not just doing basic boilerplate code, it requires mental energy to do this. So save your mental energy for the challenges you have that are actually really worth thinking about, and just find out everything you can about your language. So yeah, um, be curious about what your language can do, um, get more out of it, and make your life easier. And that's it. Thank you, Ben. Um, check that out, 18, 18 post-it notes. But, but also 18 speakers, so now you have to clap for them as well, because these are just post-it notes. <laughs> now, I'm not an organizer of the conference. I want to um, thank all of them for giving me the microphone. Uh, and because I have the microphone, I have the power, which means I am going to invite all of our Lightning Talk speakers to sign the poster, because you are all KiwiPyCon speakers now. Woo! So on your way out the door, on your way out to lunch, I'd like each one of you Take your, take your place among all of these wonderful speakers we've had this weekend and sign the poster.